I'd like to reinforce the announcement about this year's World Changers Summit. I cannot tell you, it took me a while to get there, but how elated I am about what we're going to be doing this year, and I believe it's going to be the highest viewed and the highest attended uh, conference we've ever had. And uh, we have some phenomenal speakers, and we have some awesome uh, facilitators. And this year, what I felt led to do was the theme called Collide. How many of you understand uh, in the, the virtual world and in this world that in industry and ministry has been separate for far too long. That people think that when you are called to an industry, that it means that your ministry is for Sunday morning. But God has called this church to Monday. Say yes. yes. I said God has called this movement to Monday. It is not just about what we can do in the 90-minute segment that we're together on Sundays, but about how we can translate that. You don't see how mature you are on a Sunday morning. Yell back at me. You see how mature you are on Monday. It shows up in your workspace, your work life, even your work relationships. And so what we're doing through the Conference Collide, uh, uh, the World Changer Summit, is we're providing information and training for every industry possible. We got faith. Family, finance, fitness, fashion, film. We've got all of these things we're pulling together that have different components. So I would that you prepare yourself for everything that we've got going on, all kinds of electives and options uh, that we're going to have made available to the saints. So I am excited uh, about that. Amen. And from what I understand, we do have deliverance this Tuesday. Dr. Ross, please correct me if I'm wrong. We do have deliverance. How many of you know the saints need the devil cast out? <laughs> The quarantine <laughs> has tried to awaken some stuff in folk, and uh, it is just important. Now, here's the deal with this uh, session. Ain't going to be no, <laughs> if you're going to have to cough, you're going to have to go all the way outside and do so and listen from this room. You're going to have to sneeze them devils out or something. Figure it out. Amen. But uh, we're going to be ministering deliverance to the saints of God. I have a very uh, uh, unique word today from the Lord. Uh, we're still in the series after this. And what I've been attempting to do prophetically is help God's people realize that irrespective of how you feel and the raging that's going on in the inner man, there is an after this. And uh, the enemy would have it that many people take their eyes off. Off the after this. But there was an after this for Israel. There was an after this for the 12. There was an after this for the church. There was always going to be an after this. And there are moments and periods in history where things catch us off guard. But here's what you got to know about the, the, the wonderful nature of Adonai is nothing catches him by surprise. I've often told people that it, it is impossible to disappoint a being that knows everything. He knows what you're going to do before you know it. He knows how you're going to react before you know it. And so we're looking at some extremely prophetic concepts. I had not realized that since we had been regathering in small amounts in the sanctuary uh, that it has seemed as if every Sunday I had been moving into prophecy. <clears throat> But it's because the people of God, I think the heavens are filled, the clouds are filled right now with revelation and mysterium concerning what God is doing next because God's people are waning weary. And whenever there is weariness in the earth, God responds with the word. The prophet says, uh, he has given me a word, the tongue of the learned, that I would speak a word unto him that is weary. And so I think it is uh, appropriate that we begin to talk prophetically. Uh, there's a lot of people in the earth right now that's talking optimistically. And there's a lot of people in the world that's talking pessimistically. But ain't a whole bunch of pe people talking prophetically. And so I've just got to do what I know to do. And that's make sure that the people of God understand that there is still a word from the Lord. A and the Bible said that heaven and earth will fa uh, fade away before one jot. Or I love this term, tittle. That means comma. You know, anything like that is not going to change what God has something to say. If you're watching me, uh, I want you to type, he's still got something to say. If you're in the room, I want you to just put your hand on your own chest and say, he's still got something to say. Come on, Zion. I said, say, he's still got something to say. One of the most dangerous things, and I'm going to get to my text, that you could ever do is move before the man stops talking. Uh, God is still saying something. Every word that proceeds is. So we cannot turn our ear over to captivity. But we've got to be willing to contend with the words we receive from the Lord. I feel led to say this before I go to my text. 
This is the perfect time, DeAndre, to start re-listening to prophetic words. And I'm not just talking about thematic prophetic words from the year. I'm talking about being able to revisit things God's been saying over the last 10. You need to go back and see it. And there will be some things that came to pass. And there will be some things that are still pending. But what you're going to find out is the Lord has been faithful to you. That, that you, are, you have walked in more fulfillment than you have ever realized for. And so if ever you find yourself becoming emotionally unstable or becoming disturbed, what I love to do as a matter of personal encouragement is go back and find out how much of it came to pass. Because if you do that, then what ends, what ends up happening is you change your perspective and you change your mind and anxiety breaks off of your life concerning what's next. Review the faithfulness of God through what he's spoken before and what he's done before and you will realize that it all came to pass. I wish I had help. Won't nobody say nothing. I said it all has come to pass. You are, you, you're probably working right now in fulfilled prophecy. Your house right now is probably fulfilled prophecy. When you look at your children when you look at your doctor's report it is probably fulfilled prophecy so we cannot allow the enemy to take our eyes off of fulfillment and the people of the Lord said amen I want to go to John's gospel the 12th chapter and I want to use this in a very specific version John's gospel chapter 12 and I'm going to give you a couple of things to compare it to This is John chapter 12, verse 27, and I want to read it in the English Standard Version, in the ESV. I'm going to read this in the English Standard Version. When you're there, say, I'm there. If you're on my uh, cyber church, type, I'm there. I guess nobody's there. <laughs> We're going to John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 27. This is the words of our Savior while being antagonized about um, the trial he's about to face. Uh, the crime of high treason, and he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? This is in the English Standard Version. Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose, I have come to this hour. John 18, 37, let's compare it there. John 18, 37 in the English Standard Version. Your name is Power. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus said, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. I'll conclude in the epistle of John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 to create an accurate foundation for where we're going in this. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, and I'll give you this in KJV. <clears throat> he that committed sin is of the devil. <laughs> for the devil sinneth from the beginning. But for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Father, help me to preach this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're studying today before we go into ministry in the spirit, and I want you to write this down for note-taking, an appointment with purpose. An appointment with purpose. Uh, put your hand on your chest. Say, I don't want to be late because I have an appointment. Open your mouth. Say, I don't want to be late because I have an appointment. We're living in days, before we go to our text, we're living in days where it is quite easy to forget the extreme necessity of paying attention to purpose. People are paying attention to peril and they're paying attention to uh, news and they're paying attention to uh, even provisional issues and crises. But what the enemy desires to do, even through the year that we're calling 2020, is take your eyes off of purpose. And for a lot of reasons, that's going to end up opening your life to a lot of unnecessary distractions because all you've got is purpose. 
You're breathing for it. You're walking for it. You are saved because of it. Say yes. And so I love what the Apostle John affords us in what he writes, uh, even in his angle of the gospel. And I love the fact that the way he writes in his gospel is different from any of the other synoptic gospels. He writes from the place of intimacy. And so it is absolutely appropriate that because of his unique relationship with the Messiah, he understands and has watched and has recorded several moments in the life of the Savior where Jesus used purpose statements to combat an interrogator or purpose statements to combat an antagonist. And so this is extremely uh, important because you see uh, that there, there's vision of how Jesus responded in moments of, uh, of chaos uh, by combating his purpose. You even see it in Matthew chapter 4 when the Bible says Satan came up to him and started to tempt him for 40 days. He responded yes with the word but with the power of his purpose. And so so I don't know that we are paying attention to as much as we are the purpose of the organization, the purpose of the marriage, the purpose of the name, the purpose of the investment. And so when you start to refine things that are uh, uh, aligned by purpose, you end up knowing that provision gets easier. Say yes. You end up being able to determine what relationships come. Say yes. Purpose will not only determine who comes, but sometimes it determines who goes. Say yes. Purpose has a way of situating you in a season where you can focus more than you ever have. Now, the life of Christ shows us that purpose is the most powerful thing under the word of God that you can possess. So the principle that I want to introduce to you now is purpose is power. Purpose is power. Purpose is power. If you have purpose, you have power. You don't realize, or maybe you do, but I'm going to act like you don't realize how much the enemy is after your identity. You don't realize how much he is committed to changing, and I want to use the word reorientating, not only what you believe about God, but what God said about you. He's after your identity. It's a, it's a, it's a real crisis in the world where you can always tell when people don't know who they are by what they do and also who they do it to. Identity is the root issue of a lot of attack of a lot of strife, of a lot of division. You will find that sometimes the most chaotic people in a church or on a company, or on a team, are those that know the least about themselves. What they end up becoming is a composite of everybody they meet or who they admire or who they need, and they end up exhibiting traits that show that they don't have an identity. But Jesus shows us that purpose is power and purpose is revealed by identity. Now, you can have gifts, talents, dreams, ambitions, but without the anchor of purpose, you run the risk of becoming successful at the wrong thing. And there's a lot of people that are thriving in the wrong thing. And they are fighting for the wrong thing to find purpose there. So that means that God, according to our text and according to how he built Jesus, creates everything with divine purpose. Humans, however, are the ones that struggle the most to discern it. We want to decide it. But you have to discern purpose because it's not your decision. And the people of the Lord said yes. Now, one of the things that I want to introduce you to is that according to the comparative analysis of where we've been in our text, you will never have a problem that's more powerful than your purpose. I'm going to say that again. You will never have a problem. Nothing will ever come up in your life that is more powerful than your purpose. As a matter of fact, for some of us, the reason we have certain problems is because we abandon certain angles of purpose. So then purpose has the power to break the authority of the problem. Dr. Miles Monroe says, where purposes are unknown, abuse is inevitable. I can look at the trail and the track of what you do and allow in your space and what you do and allow even in your home and determine whether or not you have a grasp or a grip on your purpose. I can look at the effort you put into your academic life, what you spend time studying, what you spend time investigating, and tell whether or not you've got a grip on purpose. Unfortunately, I can also look at your exes. And for some of you, your currents. And tell you what you got going on in the realm of purpose. Because we attract sometimes what we believe about ourselves. Say yes. Now, everybody right now is in pursuit of more. 
They want more money, more real estate, more relationship, more access. I don't think people want a greater understanding of purpose just yet. Because purpose brings a parameter. It means that when I'm in my purpose, I have certain allowances and allocations and certain permissions that other people may or may not have. And so we need to come to this issue and examine it in the life of Jesus Christ. Our text shows that when you're dealing with the issue of purpose, you're going to experience two things. I want you to write this down, an interrogator. You're going to experience an interrogator. And then you're also going to experience an antagonist, an antagonist. You are not the only one that has questions about who you are. There are other things and there are other entities that have questions about from whence you came. They want to know what you think about it, what you believe about it, and whether or not they're questioning it can break you. And whether or not their disgust of it or their discovery of it can bend you. And these don't always have to be external interrogates or external uh, 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 questions. Many times this can operate in the realm of your own psychological self. Questions that want to know whether or not you really believe firmly what God called you to do, but most importantly, what God called you to be. Say yes. So the text reveals that the purpose does not always manifest itself in comfortable ways. I think that if that were the case, most of us would be okay in the realm of purpose. If it could only happen in realms of affirmation and validation, we would be okay with fighting with it. Most times purpose is revealed in uncomfortable moments. When odds are against you, when pressures are on you, when you don't have very clear paths for the next step and the next journey, Jesus shows us in this way that he was being uh, interrogated by superiors, governmentally speaking, and they were trying to accuse him of treason, and he, uh, he responded two times with the fact that he was born to do a thing. He was born to do a thing. This means if I was born to do it, then only me and God can stop me from it. I have to allow an enemy. I have to allow an adversity to stop me from what I was born to do. Can I pray for you really quickly? I believe the spirit of grace is trying to reconcile you with why you were born. I believe the spirit of grace is trying to make you forgive why you were born. I believe he's trying to open up your eyes to consider the data and the details. Lord, let the eyes of this people be open again. Let them see and consider that their birth was not validated by a certificate but by prophecy. And help them to walk in the reason for their birth forever in Jesus' name. Say amen. Now, Jesus poses a very profound rhetoric with being faced with the reality of what his purpose could cause imminently fall upon him or to, uh, could call to fall upon him. And what I love that he says in this first court trial was, even though my soul is in distress. I want you to write this in the comments and I want you to write this on your notes in the room. If I'm going to start to examine my purpose, I've got to ask myself, how is your soul? Because when dealing with the issue of purpose, you're dealing with the state of the soul. The soul becomes the lens by which you perceive your purpose. So if you've got all kind of funny business going on in your inner man, it will inevitably impact how you see but also hear purpose. This means that you've got to pay attention to what's going on in your thought life. You've got to pay attention to and trace and track what's going on in your emotional life. You've got to also pay attention to the type of information, listen to me, that you're holding from past seasons in your life of people who did that, of people who said that, of people who left, of people who came, of people who robbed, of people who stole. In, in every heart, pay attention, there is a database of information and pictures and thoughts and sensitivities that's got to be emptied out before you are trusted fully with the desire of God for your life and very many people in the house of God have not learned the art of emptying it out it's, it's, sometimes it's about casting it out but other times it's about emptying out how many of you know God will accept your pain as an offering there, there can be people that do things intentionally or not to hurt or to harm or to wound you but when you give that thing to the Lord it becomes very very fragrant you cannot hold hurt 
and see your purpose. You cannot walk around willingly wounded because what people do is they want to walk around with the wound for the sake of being able to justify their next action and their next move. You have to release hurt to the Lord. You've got to release woundings to the Lord. And however you got to do it, through counseling, through pills, through medicine, however you got to get the thing out, you've got to empty it out because it's occupying the place of purpose. It's, it's, it's in the area where your purpose is about to be revealed. Who feels God on that? You've got to empty that thing out. I understand what they said, but you've got to let it go. I understand what they did, but you've got to let it go. I understand that it was unjust, but you've got to let it go because what's really in prison is your traction towards your purpose. It's hard to be in purpose if you won't let go of pain. You can choose to decide what's going to hurt you. Now, I know they don't like that gospel because we think that our hurt is involuntary. No, I can decide if I'm going to let what you do hurt me or not because my purpose is more important than any person that's going to come, go, stay, cuss, judge, whatever. I'm in my purpose, so people are not as important. Purpose will concentrate you that way, and we saw that several times in the life of Jesus. And I'm often fascinated, Dr. Kenny, with how the Son of Man would admit in a legal trial being wrongly and falsely accused even though my soul is in distress. He goes further and says, do you think I'm going to ask God to save me from this hour? Do you think I'm going to ask God to change this season and to change this time? He says, no, because for this cause, this purpose, came I into the world. What focused his psychological pressure was the fact that he was born for what he was facing. Now, let me just put a little bit of preaching power right there. I don't give a nickel's worth of dog meat about what the devil got you thinking you facing. I want you to make this declaration over yourself. I was born for this. I can tell you I have been visited by some creatures this year that I ain't seen since I was a boy. And there were many times like Jesus with wild beasts, I had to look at devils and say, ah, <laughs> was born, Lord have mercy, for this. I didn't even have to bind and loose. What I did was I reminded the inferior thing, I was born for this. Therefore, you can stay and watch all you want. You go run before I do. How many of you know in Matthew 4, the Bible says, and the devil leaveth him for a season, and the angels came back. How many of you know if you know what you were born for, it will determine what's going to run from you. His soul was distressed, but he didn't want to be saved from the moment. He didn't want to be saved from the moment. If you're going to understand the way purpose manifests, you've got to understand the importance of accepting the moment. You, you have to stand in the moment. Now, I'm not the most patient person, but I don't know a lot of people that see the future and have the patience they need. But there have been several times when I've asked God to hurry the moment. C can we just hurry up and get this over with? Let's just hurry up. I I'm, I'm telling you, I've said it jokingly, but I've meant it. Please rush me to 2021. <laughs> but there is something happening in the moment. And, and, and if you miss, listen, the ministry of the moment, what's going to happen is there's going to be something in you that's not made. You're not just made by what you say. You're made by the moments you handle right. And 2020 is like a moment right now in the world, in the earth, in the body of Christ. And those moments are making you, come on, those moments are, are, are upgrading you. It's giving you mental fitness, taught you some stuff about how you really are not as resilient as you should be. It also taught you about what you're willing to do when you got too much time on your hand. It's a moment though and you've got to walk into moments in order to be made in the way that upholds you in your purpose. Say yes. Now the other thing that I love about our text is that I don't think Jesus was just saying this stuff for himself. I think he was saying it as a teaching moment for those that were around him. That when you are being questioned at the realm of your identity, you're being questioned in the realm of your assignment, sometimes you've got to say out of your 
own mouth that this is purpose because purpose predates all of this stuff. Purpose predates uh, uh, the king and, 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 and purpose predates the accusation into jail. So purpose is the older thing. The problem with us is our culture teaches us how to be a person. And they don't understand that we were a purpose before we were a person. So we put our personality above our purpose because it's the easier thing to find out. But what happens is when you start to discern and discover purpose, you end up controversial, changing certain stuff in your personality. A person in purpose seldom says, that's just how I am. Because what happens is as you mature and as you navigate towards your assignment, you start to make adaptation, you start to make adjustment, you start to deal with the stuff that's in the way of your fullest potential. Because the first conversation is purpose. But you can't talk about potential until you talk about purpose. To understand the potential of a thing, you have to know the purpose of a thing. This shows us that there is often in every life appointments with purpose. I'm going to give you three thoughts now about our text that I want you to take home and meditate. Number one, Jesus shows us through this conversation and dialogue from every angle in the, in the scriptures, and this is something you have to understand, that it is possible, number one, for people to respond in several ways at the announcement of purpose, the discovery of purpose, the study of it. The first way that people can respond is they can reject it. You can reject your own purpose. There are so many people trying to force them to be what they just simply are not. You can reject purpose. You, you can try to fit in certain definitions and certain parameters. You can reject it. Jesus shows it is possible there. Number two, here's the other interesting thing, Pastor Erica. The implication of his conversation shows that there will be people that want to be saved from purpose, meaning they want to escape it. They, they think that it, purpose has caused them certain danger or put certain things around them that uh, they would prefer not to live in and with. Number three is the worst one. He shows us in this particular conversation that there are people who subconsciously desire God to change his mind about purpose. Who going to lie? How many of you have ever asked the Lord, Will you please reconsider what you want me to do? Oh, the church is lying this morning. How many of you have either in the heart or the mind looked at somebody you wanted romantically, looked at a career you really were passionate about, looked at a group of friends or socioeconomic class that you wanted to find membership and asked God, can you please reconsider? You won't be honest, so I will. I have tried, Marcus, to negotiate all the time. Here am I, send him. <laughs> I don't want to do this. But when you're dealing with a holy God whose wisdom is all-encompassing but also eternal, you're not going to ever get him to change his mind about what he wants about you. Even his chastisement to you is about his purpose for you. He scourges people not so that they can just feel the repercussions of an action. He scourges them to strip them from the layers of stuff on their life that's got them lying about their purpose. It's called the pruning of the Lord. So there are people who want God to change his mind. Why in the world would people want to reject purpose? Because it's easier, now listen, to live like you don't know who you are. It's much easier to go to work and do what they do. It's much easier to talk on the phone and say what they say. It's much easier to not have to explain to your family and your familial system why you veered off from their trajectory, from a place of iniquity into blessing. It's easier to do that. This means that purpose is going to put some very uncomfortable conversations in your mouth. You're going to have to very often explain why you don't have the same allocations as other people because you are being prudent about the subject of your purpose. And so here is the next war if we're going to take this deeper. I, I, because the quietness is in the room, I feel like this is dealing with so many of you. 
You spent so much time researching so much this year that you did not act like you still had purpose and that you still should live in pursuit of it. Now, I'm going to take this a little bit deeper, if you will allow. The greatest war in the heart is not sin and righteousness. The greatest war in the heart is plans versus purpose. Plans versus purpose. I understand. The two are not the same. Many are the plans in a man's heart. You know, you, you grow up trying to plan. And, and, and those of you that are professional planners, I feel sorry for you. Because you can't handle spontaneous seasons very well. Something happened later than it should or without your expectation. You can't put on your black book. You go into all kinds of depression and distress. But the war in the heart is plans versus purpose. Purpose, then, should determine the plan. Many are the plans in a man's heart, the book of Proverbs says, but it's the purpose of the Lord that prevails. I want you to write the word prevail. Now, in the Bible, there are certain words that have much deeper ancient meaning than the obvious one. Now, when you look at the word prevail from an English standpoint, you think it means just to win. But that's not the deepest meaning of it. The word prevail in the Hebraic context is a military term that means to battle until something is dead. Your purpose is probably aggressively fighting a lot of things that you got planned for your life. I know you want me to turn my plow, but the purpose of God is probably the reason why certain plans don't work. See, so you got to realize that even though stuff seems inconvenient and stuff seems delayed and stuff seems surprising, that it does not mean the hand of the Lord is not on it. I have learned in very many seasons of life, the hand of the Lord will come into certain situations, certain scenarios, and mess the perfect puzzle up to make sure that his purpose is protected. Ask me why. He will protect your purpose but at, while hurting your feelings. He, he, he doesn't care about you not liking what he's doing and not liking how he's doing it. The purpose of the Lord is going to prevail, prevail. is going to fight up against and stand up against any plan that is in the way of his purpose. He has purpose. He has purpose. He has purpose. I want to give you an a, a implica, a implicatory issue about this issue of plan. People create plans for a lot of reasons. Some, some it's success, uh, others it's notoriety. For a lot of people, it's fulfillment. I, I feel fulfilled as I achieve and move and do this. Some do it out of revenge. That, there are people, they won't be honest, Lachelle, that plan in retaliation. And not just to people, but also to their own past. There's a lot of people pursuing progress because of who behind them didn't believe they could do it. And so their motivator is trying to escape, listen, the stigma of the story. They want to get away from the narrative that was negative about who they were. So they started trying to prove stuff to the past. Lift your hands. In the name of Jesus, may you be emancipated from having to prove anything to your past. You ain't got nothing to prove, and you don't owe nobody in the past nothing. Stop trying to prove yourself to the past. It's okay to move on in purpose. Say amen. amen. Proverbs 16 and 9 says, in a man's heart, he plans his course. But the Lord is the one who will determine his steps. In a man's heart, he plans his course. But the Lord is the one who will determine his step. Pastor Kenny, what this shows us is that our conversation that Jesus has in both of these scenarios and even in the description of him in John's epistle shows that this was a heart matter. Because purpose is not revealed to the mind. And purpose is not revealed to the feelings. And purpose is not revealed even by tests. And, and purpose is not revealed by um, a multiple quiz surveys. Purpose can only be found once the heart is examined. Now, this is a thing we have to deal with in this year. There are some battered places in the hearts of so many people. And the scar tissue is preventing them from being sensitive to their purpose. It is possible to have lived a certain type of life where you've had your heart shattered, whether uh, by other people or stupid stuff you've done or heard or said or believed or thought, and not realize that their brokenheartedness is keeping you blind to certain dimensions of purpose. 
The heart determines what you believe. It's not the mind. It's the heart. And one of the things the Lord has told me to do in this season in the body of Christ is call us to the issue of the heart. And where it is, it's quiet, not just on the internet. Now, I can't hear nobody typing. I can't hear nobody saying. They don't like talking about the issues of the heart. Because when you've got to be honest about what's going on in your heart, sometimes it's embarrassing. There will be moments when you look at your heart and say, man, self, and yourself say, huh? And you say, I should really be over this or beyond this. I really should not have this going on. Why do I still battle with this particular issue? But it's important that you have a healed heart. It's important that you have a whole heart because the Bible says the issue or seasons of life flow from that place. There's a lot of people talking but not looking at what's happening at the heart level. And that's important. The purposes are in the heart. But Proverbs writer says it's in a man's heart where the plans are, but the Lord directs the purpose. I believe that there are things that we pursue that's a reflection of how the heart is pivoted. Can I prophesy for a minute? The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is in need of a massive heart transplant. Uh, 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 literally where the cavity of that thing is opened up. There is so much entitlement. There is so much bitterness, so much rebellion, and this is not just in the quote-unquote African-American church. It's, it's with the other churches too, the, the, the evangelical churches. They need a heart transplant because when you can see, uh-oh, the pain of people that you're not like and choose to minimize it and then go to church and talk in tongues, it's not just a race war. This is a heart war in America. And what this last, ele ooh, this last thing did in America was confront what the heart was actually doing of the nation. It revealed it. It exposed it. So now we're scurrying and scrambling over the divide when we've not been beating at the same rhythm for centuries. It's a heart issue. America has not fulfilled her purpose. And the reason she has it is because she's got a heart problem. She's had a heart attack. Something's happened where it's not been able to beat at the rhythm and at the pace she was designed to do that for. How, how many understand that? Now, purpose will launch you into several things. Let me give you this because this has to be taught to you. Number one is going to launch you into processes. Purpose will determine your processes. But if you're writing notes, write this as a caveat. Processes are personal. I think the problem with us is we get into a process and then try to ha have company in it. <laughs> I want you to understand it. I want you to be in it with me. I want you to hold my hand through this. I'm here to tell you, no matter how many friends you've got, no matter how many families you've got, all 20 of your spiritual fathers and mothers, there are certain things that you're going to have to walk through by yourself. There are certain decisions you're going to have to navigate through and walk through and think through. And here's why. There will be moments of purpose in your life and in your assignment where you're not going to have an audience. All purpose is not performed in front of people. So you've got to learn how to do some things by yourself. I love your word. Jesus was a man of great company, students, masses. But one of the things that I admire about the Messiah is he was not afraid to be alone. Come on through here. Now, I know that scratches a place in you because we are in a hyper-romantic culture. I know you want me to turn my, everything has romanticism around it. But Jesus was not afraid. I could be with you. <laughs> but I can also depart to a mountain to pray. Be very careful if you're afraid to be by yourself it, it, because it might show that you're uncomfortable with yourself and you can never take care of somebody you're still trying to grow be comfortable with. Self-care is about what we exchange in relationship, but it's also about my own comfortability with my process. Say, don't despise the process. Come on, don't be sad. Say, don't despise the process. The second thing that is going to determine you won't like this is certain trials. Your purpose will determine certain trials. I don't care how much you cry. You know, one of the things, and it's a very popular song, we, one of my favorite ones, it's a scriptural song. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them from all of them. 
Trials are those or uh, situations or circumstances that happen. Watch this. Beyond your control. They happen around you. They happen environmentally. They happen relationally. There is, you, you, you will not be able, take a deep breath if you're in the room, just don't breathe on nobody but yourself. You can't bind a trial. You can't rebuke a trial. I, I rebuke you. I'm not going through this. There are certain trials that the Lord will allow as it pertains to your purpose. Say yes. Your purpose is also going to determine your training. It's very individual how you're being trained. There, there was a season uh, in my life when I was learning about the prophetic. I was learning about the depth of and the power of and the holiness of being chosen to be somebody who spoke for God. And this is going to sound crazy to you and it, it, because it is. But the Lord deals with his prophets just a little differently. And I remember trying to get delivered from a cussing problem. Um, and I tried hard. And then so I went through a season where I was, you, I was cutting my conversation off at a certain time limit. So if I was speaking over eight or nine minutes, I would shut up. I was learning to train my tongue and my speech to not over talk. What you see in terms of accuracy in my ministry of the prophetic is not years of just fasting and prayer. It's telling my tongue what to do. It's, it's being able to command it and being able to make it submit to it. This is why this black man is scared to say what God ain't. If God ain't said it, I'm not saying, I'm not one of those that's going to prophesy from my soul. If I ain't heard it, I ain't saying nothing. It's about training, training, training. The other thing is going to determine is this, pressures, 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 cranial pressures, cerebral pressures, emotional pressures. It's going to determine relational, just things that have to exist under a certain weight. Now, if you want life to be fair, you'll never be able to stand under pressures. Because what pressures prove to you is that life is not meant to be fair, it's meant to be purposeful. The pressure that you're going to stand under in certain moments or decisions in your life will not be like other people in your world. If I take this differently or deeper, even the pressures of a husband are much different from a, the pressures of a wife. I'm kind of old school. I think the wife should not have Lord Jesus today in America. I don't think women should have the same pressures as men. I don't think that wives should stand under the same stresses as men. I was raised by a breed of men who if they saw their women under inhumane, abnormal pressures, they relieved it. They did what they needed to do to make sure that their feminine self could not be compromised by standing under masculine pressures. Which is why provision was never supposed to be a woman's primary job. If a man don't work, I can't get help. If you see the power of pressure and what it does, I think that some cancers are born from it. I think that disease is born from it. I think that there are uh, 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 emotional traumas and disorders born under people who are under wrong pressures. Now, as a caveat to that, because I sense this prophetically, God's going to do something with very many people watching me. He's done it in my life and very often kind of like Hosea, when the Lord starts doing something in my world, it's like a, a, a foreshadow of things that's to come in the kingdom. There's so much family reconciliation that's about to hit the earth. It's going to be very unusual. He's answering the prayers about many of you that have had odd family relationships over the years. But one of the things you will have to learn to do is put up boundaries. Because what will happen is if you don't have boundaries, sometimes pressures will be projected on you. And you won't know how to say no, particularly if you share a last name. So, so boundaries are important. They protect the definition of the relationship and the functionality of it. Say yes. Then the final one in this category of teaching is your purpose will also determine the places. The places. It's going to escort you to some places you did not know. 
is going to take you away from some places you want it to know. And you'll find yourself in very unusual environments about, around very unusual people. God knows the rooms that you need, even if you don't. He knows the environments that you need. He knows who needs to be around, what you need to see, what you need to hear, what you need to observe. But they are all directly connected to intestinal purpose. The thing that's in you at the gut level, at the core of a man. Say yes. Now, final word. Jesus, and I love this about this man, I've never read in any of the New Testament where he compared himself. People did. Some say you are. Some say you are. Some say you are. Jesus never felt the pressure to compare himself to anything during his life or anything before. There was no pressure there. You know why? The easiest way to weaken, deflate, and conceal your purpose is through comparison. And many of you don't know how often you do it. It's become very, very, very subconscious. Maybe you don't compare how they look versus how you look, but you may compare their progress to yours. You may compare their rhythm to yours, their rate to yours, their calendar to yours. Comparison is a, a, a cancer to purpose discovery. So if you look at this, you'll find that envy and jealousy are the most common ways that people lose sight of their own purpose. No matter how hard anybody tries, your superpower is that you are you. That's it. And there are people who will desire it, they want to be it, but they ain't going to ever be you. So that means that what you have to do is cultivate, deepen, and develop how good you are at being you. If you're not good at being you, an addiction is on the way. If you're not good at being you, a snare is on the way. If you're not good at being you, you'll never have fruitful relationships because every time somebody leaves you, every time a friend leaves you, you equate every leave to a loss. You, you don't run after people if they want to walk away in relationships. But if you got a relational cycle around you, it could be showing that you got some issues in you where you are addicted to attention because you don't understand purpose. So here's five things your purpose needs. And I'm going to probably prophesy. Maybe. Number one, your purpose needs your permission. It, it needs your permission. You have to give your purpose permission to unfold, to unlock, to do what it needs to do, to work in the way it needs to work. Number two, your purpose needs your passion. If you're going to be uh, mediocre, if you're going to be lukewarm, if you're going to be indifferent toward your purpose, you may as well not even have one. Passion is a very important thing, but they work powerfully both in the hands of the devil and in the hands of God. If the enemy gets a hold of your passion, it's going to do a whole bunch of crazy stuff in your life. But, but, but passion misplaced ensnares your children. If you don't grab a hold of your passions, the unborn in you will be trapped. You have some issues because somebody before you might not have gotten a hold of things they were passionate about. And then there are others of us that are simply passionate about the wrong stuff. Put energy there, mental focus there, so your purpose needs your passion. There needs to be a marriage there. I am passionate about my purpose. I am passionate about my purpose. I eat it, I breathe it, I sleep it, I dream it, I write it, I say it, I see it, I feel it on me, I feel it over me. I'm passionate about my purpose because I refuse to live a life without it. Number three, your passion needs your pursuit. Your pursuit. That means to walk after it in its direction. How many of you can tell the truth and say there have been moments in your life, either of discouragement or distraction, that you were walking in the opposite way of your purpose? There's a lot of people watching me right now. Uh, uh, specifically, there's some people that was up last night trying to battle in their head about whether or not they were going to walk in the direction of purpose or not. 
what do you think the enemy's goal for temptation is? To get you to walk reverse from the purpose of God. To get you to walk backwards in the opposite direction, in the opposite way. That's why all seduction ain't about sex. It's about the direction of purpose you're headed to. And if he has to use thighs to do it, then that's just the bait to pull you away. But the bigger agenda is to make sure that by any means and all costs, you are not who you were born to be. That's what hell is after, your pursuit. Number four, here's a big one. Here is a big one. I think this is probably too practical for y'all, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Your purpose needs your prayers. You, you know, you start to perceive different fundamentals about your purpose as you pray into it and pray about it. You know, I think we need deliverance from a religious spirit that's got us afraid to ask God very specific questions. And some of us won't allow our hearts to do it to be braced from disappointment. We don't really want to know the answer or we don't trust that what we hear is going to be right. So because we fear deception, my God, today, we don't have the right conversations and discussions. But ye will know the truth. Come on, church. I said, and ye will know the truth. God loves you too much to allow you to be deceived for too long. He will allow something to happen. A word, a dream, a vision, a burden, a fast. Something will happen to break the yoke of deception. He's not going to allow you to live a lie in protection of your purpose. So it's okay to ask God. It's okay to ask God. It's okay to ask God, who have you made me to be? Who am I becoming? What is in me? Now here's the deal. When you start talking like that to the ancient one, you've got to be braced for those responses. Because <laughs> he's never going to answer you in current language that you understand. Noah, get up. Build me an ark. It's going to rain. Sure, Lord. Hey, by the way, what's rain? <laughs> what is an ark? See, God spoke to Noah from God's world triggered the heart of Noah and then Noah responded watch this not with all the information but with willingness and there's a lot of people not in purpose because they want more info but what do you do when God uses unfamiliar language to your life and starts talking something you don't understand yet that's how he gets you to move into that direction some people hear that and be like nope if I can't google it I ain't doing it <laughs> If I don't know somebody else that's done it, I ain't doing it. If my mama don't agree with it, I ain't doing it. If my daddy don't agree with it, if I, I ain't doing it. If my age does not agree with it, I'm not going to do it. My testimony is when the Lord called me to preach, I was dumb. So I said yes immediately. <laughs> I should have taken my time to ask some more questions because I had no clue what I was saying yes to. And the Lord told me, I want you to go and I'm going to call you this. He spoke to me out of Revelation chapter 10 verse 11. Son of man, thou must prophesy again to many nations, tongues, tribes, and kings. That's my life verse. I said, sure. Sounds, sounds good. <laughs> sounds like a plan. Then I said, but hey, because these are these heart conversations. It wasn't uh, me against the king. This was me and God. Similar thing. I said, the Lord, I said, Lord, I'll go. Just tell my granddaddy you called me. <laughs> you go to him, because I'm not having this conversation, and you tell him that you called me and let him talk to me about it. Have you ever put hard decisions on the people of your life that you love because you were too afraid to do it yourself? Lord, tell him. You know what the Lord told me? Broke my poor heart. No. The Lord told me no. He told me no. And the reason he told me no was followed by this sentence of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to call you to do some things later that they're not going to agree with. And I want you to learn now to hear me. The no was the beginning of my sending. It was the beginning of my willingness to obey irrespective of the cost. It was a part of counting the cost of an obedience to God that folk would not understand. Can you imagine being Noah? No wonder he got drunk. 
He had to undergo the pain and the peril of doing what nobody before him had done. And he had to do it physically. His strength, his mind, his soul. I, you know, sometimes when we're looking at Bible stories, I think we think about it in the context of like Disney movies and stuff. I don't think Noah was happy all them years he was building that boat. I don't think he was walking around like, I've been working on the rest. No. We've got to take the scriptures out of animation and put it in real life. He probably had blisters. He probably bled. He probably had to explain to his family why he had to be out long hours and wake up very early in the morning. He probably had to work out. He probably had to be fit. He probably had to understand that this was the cause of what the Lord told him to do. So you had to pray. You got to pray. You have to pray. You have to pray. And you have to pray about issues of your purpose so you can prevent the devil from talking you out of it or sharing his voice in it. If you want to do spiritual warfare on something, stop binding the person next to you and start binding your ignorance on purpose. Five, your purpose needs your priority. One of the things that this teaches us, my text and then in life, is your priorities will change. As you get closer to understanding your purpose, you're going to notice a radical shift in priorities. Now, in church context, unfortunately, people like to decide what's important to you. And they like to make sure that they agree with your priorities. But the reason why we are not focused is because we do not deliberately decide what goes at number one. What goes at number two? What goes at number three? Some prophetic wisdom is this. Priorities will change in seasons, but you've got to decide, and you probably should do a better job at remembering them so that you can live like you have a priority. This is where I put my... Now listen, as a, as a, even if you're in the realm of business, priorities will determine where you put the most money, how you choose to invest, what is worth it, and... It will also determine who you want working on you with a project or working on you in a direction of something. It's about priorities. And, and there's a lot of people right now who have allowed this year to bring them into misplaced priorities. Their things just all kind of over the place and everything. Listen to me. Everything cannot have your equal strength. If you're like, I give 110% to everything I do. Okay. Welcome to death. Some stuff got to be 110%. Some stuff got to be 90. Some people got to be 110%. Some folk got to be 50. You got to understand what it is to prioritize where you put yourself. Because if you don't, your expectations are going to be bad. Your energy is going to be bad. You're not going to know what to do with your week and weeks. And I realize every day feels like Saturday right now. But you need to still have priorities in place. If you're deciding to use a week to produce something, do that. If you're deciding, set your life up where you protect priorities. Here's why. If you protect your priorities, the other reward you get is peace. If you notice a disturbance in peace, something has probably gotten out of place. This is why the word shalom means everything together, nothing missing, nothing broken. And so God wants to take you through a journey like he's revealing purpose to you. If Herod comes up to you and says, hey, so you say you are king and questions it. Jesus said, you say I'm a king. You are, can I give you another word from the Lord before I pray for you? It's uh, not your job to decide what they think about you. Let them have their definition of you. It's not changing your money. It's not changing your future. It ain't doing nothing with your gifts and calls. And there's a lot of us that are ensnared by another person's definition of us. Jesus said, you said that, not me. And I'm not responsible for trying to alter how you've chosen to see it. I'm just going to respond in purpose. Because you can fight my name. And you can fight my, my, my words. You can't do a thing with my fruit. So, 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 so Jesus, Jesus, Jesus basically told the king, fight my fruit. For this cause I came into the world. 
And then I love the way it closes out in 1 John 3, 8. For this cause, purpose, was the Son of Man made manifest that he might destroy the work of the devil. The most important thing you need to realize is that your purpose is a warfare weapon. It's something God's going to use to free something, to make something possible. God, through you, is going to open up stuff uh, to people to bring new possibilities or new awarenesses or new exposure. One of the things that um, is an anointing on my life is it's, I call it the first anointing. And what I mean is that when the Lord assigns me to a thing or a people or a person or a church, they experience a lot of firsts. So there's a lot of people who always say, I've never done that before. This is my first this, my first that, my first. It's a, it's a, a, a realm-breaking anointing. What I feel like God is trying to do in this place is bring many of you into a season where you're going to be the first to do a lot of things in your family line and story that you have to be courageous enough to embrace and courageous enough to do. One of the things that fights purpose is rape, literal rape. Molestation fights purpose. What the enemy does is he uses sexual violation to obscure a person's trust in protectors and to make them so internal that they never come out of themselves to pursue purpose. It's all going to end and land there. So I'm praying for people watching me. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I, those of you that have been victims of rape, wow, and molestation, let the anointing to heal flow through these airwaves in Jesus' name to to undo the memories and the moments and the, the visions and the, the sounds and the, the fears that were born. And I'm asking, Father, that all around this world, everyone watching me, that for every man, woman, boy and girl watching me, even those that are currently experiencing some form of sexual brutality and sexual violation, I command your body parts to come back to you in Jesus' name. Everything that the enemy tried to reorientate on your physical self, your psychological self, I prophesy wholeness to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Wholeness to your mind, wholeness to your body. In the name of Jesus, even uh, uh, women watching me, whose power to bring forth and produce was robbed by some vicious sexual attack. I loose the healing power of God in your direction in Jesus holy name I speak to your uterus I speak to your womb I command that thing to open up let the scarring be uh, gone and healed in the name of Jesus I see miracles happening Lord do this around the world in Jesus name begin to reorientate men and women in the name of Jesus and pour out the healing balm of Gilead to make people brave enough to pursue their purpose in the name of Jesus. If you're in the room, just lift your hands real quick. Father, in Jesus' name, I'm praying that in all nations, worship assembly, that you would reveal yourself as El Roe. The God that sees. The God that sees. And you're not just seeing to look you're seeing so that we know that if nobody ever understands if nobody ever comprehends if nobody ever gets it you see us you see us your word declares that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth looking for someone to show himself strong in Lord may we be reminded this morning that you see us you see our attempts hey you see our effort hey you see our try hey you see the position of our heart and even when people don't understand it or misjudge it you see us your eyes are upon the righteous and right now in the name of Jesus I bind and take authority over the agenda and the assignment of loneliness trying to bring God's people into hysteria into insanity and even delusion we see the agenda of the devil uh, trying to bring lies uh, through the doorway of loneliness but this morning let the river of truth uh, the river of truth uh, flood the hearts of your people in Jesus holy name
I pray for their minds. I pray for their thinking. I pray for their thought life. I pray for their meditation. In the name of Jesus. Ah, begin to help us. Revive us. Hey, 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 hey. Revive us according to your word. Your word is true. Spirit of the living God. We yield our entire self to you now. We yield our fears. We yield yield our ambitions we yield our desire we yield our vision we yield our views we yield our ways we yield our words we yield our character and we give you full permission to change whatever you want to lord whatever is operating around us that's preventing us from the purpose of god that you created from our lives this morning we offer it even like a sacrifice consume it your word declares our God our God our God is a consuming fire you've been refining us all year but you're doing it to get greater glory out of us and we yield to you El Roe look upon your people today all around the world we pray for the church of Jesus Christ and we want a brand new oil upon them help them to know that your eyes are there your eyes are there you see us you know us and your word declares that this was so from before the foundations of the world you didn't just start it seeing us you were looking at us on Calvary oh! you were looking at us when you made Jupiter when you made Mars when you set up the heavenlies when you blew up on the water you were looking at us you made Adam but you were thinking about us you saw us in that dirt oh yes you did and then when you went to Calvary you allowed yourself to be pierced you allowed yourself to be whipped you allowed yourself to be stabbed because when you hung on Golgotha you couldn't take your eyes off of us so we confess today like David where can I go without your presence? If I go to the ends of the earth, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take on the wings of the morning, you're there. Thank you that you're there. You're there. You're there. You're always there. You've always been there. And your word declares, I hey, will never leave you. You're there. You're there, you're there, you're there, Emmanuel, God with us, you're there, you're there, you never leave us alone, you're there, thank you for your presence, thank you for your nearness, thank you for your heavy glory, thank you for your command coming upon this people as we embrace the fact that you're looking at us, the fact that you know us, the fact that you see us, the the fact that you're there come on just begin to lift your hands and worship him for a minute come on lift your hands and worship him we are not alone we are not alone we are not alone not in the process not in the path not in the journey you are you're there you're there, hey, you're there, you're there, you're there. We love you. We bless your powerful name. of suicide trying to roam throughout this nation freely 
You've been walking in bathrooms and bedrooms. You've been messing with children. Ho! Oh! We curse your power. In the strong name of Jesus, we stand against the power of suicide today. Ah, ha, 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 ha. In the name of Jesus, we stand against the power of suicide. In the name of Jesus, you will not take the saints. We bind you. There are people that believe that dying is better than living. We come against you. Put them pills down. In the name of Jesus, drop the knife. In the name of Jesus, get out of that car. You will not drive into the river. We release life right now. A desire to live. You ain't got time to die. We burn the power and the pressure of suicide today. Hey, hey, in the name of Jesus. Uh, the thief cometh not. The thief cometh not. The thief cometh not. But to steal uh, and to kill uh, and to destroy. Uh, but I am come uh, that you might have life uh, and that more abundantly. I prophesy abundant life to you. Woo I said abundant life. Not just life, but the Zoe kind of life. The God kind of life. A poor life. A happy life. It lives after the Lord of hope. Yes, even in this room, that men desire to live again. Yes, even in this building, stir the desire to live again. Even in this building, for those that are struggling to wake up in the morning, those that don't feel like getting up out of the bed, pull your people up and out, my God. Pull them out at the belly level. Pull them up in Jesus' name. Do not allow the spirit of heaviness to come upon them in Jesus' name. I hear this scripture over this house. And those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. I command a new planting in you. That the seed of the word of God is being firmly implanted in your heart. And there is a revival at the root level. He's getting ready to do some digging and some delivering so that you will bring forth in your season and ye shall be called the planted of the Lord and the righteousness of the house of Jacob we are planted ah planted for he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaves bring forth in their season and whatsoever he does will prosper Thank you for causing us to flourish. 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 Devil, you're a liar. Thank you for calling us to flourish. Thank you, you're making us to flourish. And you're helping us to prosper, not just with cash, but in the inner man. We will not be miserable with money. In the inner man, we will not be unstable starting companies and ventures and writing and having programs. We're going to prosper and be in good even as our soul prospers let it be so over this place the planting of the Lord the planting of the Lord you shall be called the planted of the Lord the planted of the Lord is planting you I thank you Jesus for this do it in your people in the name of Jesus hallelujah this week as you prepare for whatever challenges are ahead of you set a time to go to bed set a time to wake up and get up design your routine fight for your rhythm make sure you have a schedule that you want to stick to find a hobby go fish play some pool have a card game don't you give any more emotional energy to the spirit of sadness. Don't you give any more emotional energy to grief of a plan. Listen to me. God knows what he's doing.
doing. Use all your energy to trust the Lord. He will not leave you. He promised he would.